All right, guys, we're going to be in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. Uh, it's page 857 in the Pew Bibles, so feel free to grab one of those. Again, we're uh, Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. And uh, if you will, would you please stand with me as we read the word of the Lord? And in the same region, there were shepherds out in a field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were, feel, they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a great multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, as Daniel lights this uh, second candle uh, here, uh, as we celebrate this uh, second week of Advent, as we remember and reflect on the coming, the first coming of our Lord, uh, as last week Aaron uh, announced and, and, and spoke on the hope that uh, we find in Jesus this week, we are going to reflect and dwell and look at Jesus as he is our peace. So uh, you all may be seated, and uh, then I'm going to pray for us. And we are gonna, we have a lot of work to get done this morning, so, uh, we're gonna get after it. But let's pray and ask God just to guide us as we embark on this endeavor. Our great God, we are a thankful people this morning. I pray that, uh, as we continue to reflect on your goodness to us in the, the gift of Jesus, the gift of this, this baby that came and was born to us, I pray that our hearts would be continually filled with thanksgiving for your grace to us and the things that you've given us. And I ask that as we look at you, who are our peace, who have, who have come to make peace with us, to restore peace, I pray that uh, your word would, would go forth, would be made known, that it would reveal uh, areas in our lives where, where we need to be challenged. For, for those of us who need to be encouraged and lifted up, I pray that, that your word would do that, would, would encourage and lift up those who are downhearted. And I pray that through it all, your name would be lifted up, would be exalted, and that we would leave here a people that are, uh, are, are drawn to worship you for who you are and what you've done. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I want you to take a minute this morning as we get started. Take, take just a moment and picture or imagine a place that to you would define peace? What experience or location or characteristics would need to be there for you to, to say, peace is present here. I am experiencing peace. What are those things that characterize those moments for you where you find peace? And as you think about that, many, many, many of us may have a lot of things jump to mind. Maybe there's just certain things that really stand out to you. Maybe for some of us, it's a, it's a, a getaway, a vacation home that we go to where we can, we can rest and be at peace. Maybe a place that you go to every year. Maybe in town, there's a, a location or a, a path that you go for a walk. Maybe, for you mothers there who, who spend all day with, with young children, peace for you is found when you finally get them in bed and they, they, they are asleep and you know that they're asleep and you have this moment where you find peace. What are those things for you? What is that, what is that, that place, that location, those experiences for you in which you, you can identify the experience of peace? For me, I think those moments of peace that I find that I experience are, are often tied to uh, enjoying and experiencing God's creation. For me, it's, it's getting away from, from the busyness of, of, of town and, and getting up into the mountains oftentimes. 
to experience and see the magnitude of God's creation, the calm and the quiet, maybe a mountain lake or a hike up a, up a peak. For me, oftentimes, it's, it's maybe the first ride up the chairlift, that first time going skiing every year. As you get on that lift, you, you feel the, the, the cool air, you breathe it in. The, the, the troubles and, and difficulties of the week or life just kind of fade away, and all it is is about enjoying and anticipating and experiencing that moment of, of, of rushing down the mountain, especially when it's a good powder day. There's just this, this feeling of peace that, that I experience in that. Another time is when, when I can take my beautiful wife and we can go out. We can, we can leave the mayhem of, of what oftentimes is our, is our home with, with three young children. And I can sit down with my wife and we can, we can talk, we can engage, we can enjoy each other. Those are, those are moments for me where, where I just experience what, what, I, what I think of as peace. And so for all of us, we have different things in which we can see peace, we've experienced peace. But we are people who long for peace, right? We crave it. We work incredibly hard to find it. We pursue it, and we long to experience it. And the reason that we can clearly identify specific times, places, locations, or people in which we experience and, and reflect on peace and we, and we feel peace, the reason that those moments are so, are so clear and, and can stand out to us is because in our world, we, what we often experience is a world that is not characterized by peace. You see, we see, we, we see a world, as, as we look out, you know, maybe not initially in our, in, our, in our nice little town of Fort Collins, but then you turn on the news or, or whatever, you look out abroad, or you look at your own life, your own heart, and we see a world that is marked by conflict, by fighting, by hatred. It's a world full of struggle, envy, prejudice, Betrayal, hurt, labor, tiredness. Is anybody just tired this morning? It was difficult to get out of bed. For many of us, you know, the weekend is a, is a moment and a time where we can find peace. And, and we, we rest from, from, our, from our labor and, and, the, and the, the week of work. But then Sunday afternoon always rolls around. And, and I know what that, what that feeling is like where, where the, the dread of Monday all of a sudden just somehow every week just kind of sweeps over you again. For some of you, you're experiencing it now, and I'm sorry for bringing that up, but like, but, but usually it's like somewhere between three and five o'clock in the afternoon, you're just the dread of Monday starts rolling around again. And the, and the peace that you're experiencing, you, you know you're about to lose and have to get back at it. But our world is a broken world and one where peace is difficult to find and experience it. But if Jesus is, is called our peace, and if we're going to find peace, if we're going to experience peace, then it's necessary to really understand what peace is. What is peace? What we long for. If we go to the dictionary, we can see uh, definitions like this. Freedom from disturbance, quiet and tranquility. A state in which there is no war or fighting, Freedom from disquieting or oppressive thoughts and emotions. And yes, all those things are true. All those things are, are there with peace. One of the best definitions that I've, that I've come across is by Kevin DeYoung. And uh, he says this. He says, biblically speaking, peace or shalom, as it's, as, as it's found in the Old Testament, peace points to a situation in which God's authority and rule are absolute where his creations, including human beings, exist in right relationship with him and with each other. And where there is no separation between God and man because of sin. I think that's a great definition. Where we relate rightly to God and with each other under God's authority. And this morning I want to quickly walk through the biblical narrative. I want, to, I, want to, I want to kind of just very quickly glance through and see why we don't experience the peace that we desire, that we long for, and also see how the coming of Jesus, the incarnation that we celebrate this time of year, that we look at, 
that we remember and we reflect on how it brings about the restoration of peace. And therefore, what are the implications of, of that peace that is available to us today? You see, Jesus is about restoring peace in our own hearts, in our relationships, and in our world. And that's what we want to look at this morning. So we've got a lot to get done, and we're going to get going. We're going to start at the beginning, Genesis chapter 1. And I'm going to, I'm going to read through a lot of texts. I don't, I don't expect you all to be able to turn there and find all these things, but we're just going to, we're just going to run through the biblical narrative real quick and see, see, see why we live in the condition we we're in and how we can find peace in that. In Genesis chapter 1, we see the tragic loss of peace. Genesis 1 and 2 describe the creation of a perfect world. God declares over and over as He speaks and He creates, He declares over and over that this is good. This is good. He makes a world exactly as he intended to make it. And it's a world that's characterized by peace, where Adam lives and dwells in right relationship to God. He creates man, and he does this with a very specific purpose in mind. He says that he creates man to bear or carry and display and convey his image. So he gives man a, a spiritual soul and, a, and an intellect and, and emotions and reason. And through those things, he, he gives man the task of caring for and ruling over the created order and also to then exist in relationship with other people. He creates woman so that man and woman together as God is a, is a being who exists in this Trinitarian unity, this, 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 this being in community, He then creates man and woman together that then to reflect His image as they relate rightly to each other and to God. And as God's image bearers, man was given the task and set to cultivating and expanding this perfect creation under the absolute authority and the peaceful rule of God. It was a creation of peace. But we know quickly from the story, in Genesis chapter 3, we see the rise of enmity and conflict. It tells us of man's rebellion against God. Rather than fulfilling his role to rule and reign and cultivate this creation, Adam believes the lie of the serpent and, and is deceived into joining him in rebellion against the true king. And at that moment, the peace that was established by God, that was, that, was, that was set forth in creation, is shattered and it is supplanted and replaced by enmity and conflict. So no longer do the man and the woman walk in right relationship with God, but now we see that they run from God and they hide. Do you ever feel that in your own, in your own heart, in your own life, your tendency to run from God? No longer do man and woman live in perfect relationship with each other, but it says in Genesis 3 that, that, that there's this conflict and this tension that is created within human relationships. Where, where the complementary design of, of men and women and how they were supposed to support each other and care for each other is, is supplanted by this, this battle for authority and rule and dominance that takes place in human relationships as, as more, uh, Children are born fighting in conflict and anger and jealousy break out in the human race as a result of this sin. The creation itself then comes under this curse and work, the cultivating of this garden, which originally was for, to be for the purpose of reflecting God's beauty, now becomes a burden of labor and struggle. Adam has said that he will, he will till the ground now and, it, and rather than, than bursting forth with, with, with fruit easily, it's going to be a struggle, it's going to be a fight, it's going to be a burden. Does that describe your, your work or your job or your life? And as we, as we look at this story and as we look at this narrative, it, it just makes sense of a lot of our, of our world, of what we see, of what we experience. You see, what God intended for Adam to do in the garden he, he now has to do himself, and he sets an angel to protect the garden, and he casts Adam out. And the peace that was established has melted away into conflict and strife because of sin. So there is a tragic loss of peace that has been, that has been seen. 
But we see very early on that, that there is a promise of peace restored. We see very quickly that God says, I'm not, I'm not going to let this, this be the way that it is. I'm not going to let it end here. I'm going to act. I'm going to, I'm going to do something about this. And in Genesis 3.15, we, we see the start of these seed promises where he says that through the seed of the woman, the head of the serpent will be crushed. From there, moving on in Genesis 12, we see the call of Abram, this man who, who God says that through his line, through his family, he's going to bring blessing, so, so tied with, with the idea of peace. He's going to bring blessing upon all people through this man. And then as the nation of Israel is established and all throughout the Old Testament, I wish we could spend, spend a, a lot of time just walking through and, and looking at this theme of peace throughout Israel's, Israel's history. But we see that from, from the, the, the exodus and, and God freeing his people from slavery in Egypt, there is this constant pursuit of peace in the land that God was bringing them to. And over and over again, you get these, you get these hints that, that maybe, maybe it's happening now. Maybe it's finally going to come. Places like Deuteronomy 12.10, where God says he's going to, going to give them rest in the land. In Joshua 23, after like conquering the land, it says that, that for a time they experienced rest over all their enemies. But all throughout though, there, there's something missing. Something comes in and just shatters that, that hope of peace that they see there. And all throughout, you just, you get the sense that, that, this peace is, is just so fragile. It's kind of being patched back together through the sacrificial system where, where Israel's relationship with God is, is, is mediated. It's there, but, but it is constantly being, being fractured by sin. And they constantly have to be doing it over and over and again. And they, they constantly need to restore peace. And so this peace is just being patched together and so fragile. Second Samuel 7 comes. And there's this promise. Again, that, that God is going to take the line of David and establish his kingdom forever. So there's this hope, there's these promises of what God's going to do. Then the prophets arise, these ones who proclaim for God. And there's these prophetic announcements of peace to come. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, a passage that's all too familiar for us at this time of year. But he says these words, he says, For to us a child is born, a son is given, the government, his rule, his reign, shall be on his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The increase of his government and of peace, there will be no more. Isaiah 55, 12 says, For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth in singing. Ezekiel 37 says, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant. I will set them in their land, multiply them, and my sanctuary will be in their midst. Micah 5, where, we, where we, it's familiar to us, is that declaration, that prophetic announcement of Bethlehem being the place where, where the Messiah will be born. And flowing from that, in the later verses, it says, He shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. They shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. Over and over again, the declaration of peace to be restored is made. And Israel is hopeful for this, is longing for this, is seeking this restoration of peace with God and in their nation. And then we arrive in Luke chapter 2, passage that Daniel read. And we see the announcement of the arrival of peace. And we see that he has a weak beginning. There's this, this declaration, the one who is coming to make peace arrives in a very humble manner. The peace of God comes in the form of a, a human baby. From a, from a line of people very not well known, his family, his arrival are not something you expect from someone who's going to be strong enough and mighty enough to bring in and establish peace. But he comes in fulfillment of these long-awaited promises. And this peace is first announced to these shepherds, these common men. And they are said, as they see the angel, he says, don't fear. 
It says, I'm bringing a message of joy. And for, for years and years, hundreds of years, Israel and the people had, had been living in fear and hope that this was going to come. And now he says, today, don't fear. Fear is cast aside and this new hope, this new joy is made known, is proclaimed to you. They'd been anticipating it. They'd been longing for it. And as we think about anticipation and waiting for something, there's no, no greater example of that than what we see in young children as they await Christmas, right? You know, just last week we put up our Christmas tree in our house. And that tree is like a, is, is a sign that like Christmas is on. Like it's the season. And immediately, Landon, my, my, my son, he, he says, Daddy, tomorrow's Christmas, right? Well, not yet. Not yet. It's coming. And then day after day, it's like, is tomorrow Christmas? Is it the next day? We got the tree up? He's like, we don't got presents, but like, when's Christmas? And there's this anticipation, this longing and waiting. He knows it's coming. He sees the tree. He sees the presents. He knows that it's coming. When is it coming? And then finally, it's Christmas Eve, and you could tell him, hey, tomorrow, it's, it's going to be here. And then Christmas morning wakes up, and there's... They fill with anticipation, excitement. And you say, today's the day. Like, it's here. We're, we're going to open the presents now, what they've been longing for, the anticipation of this. The, the longing turns away and melts into joy, just this excitement that I get to experience and, and joy in opening these things and taking in the pleasures of, of these gifts. And this is what is announced through the angels to these shepherds, that today in the city, this message of joy, this hope that you've been longing for is here. And it comes in the form of this, this child, this Jesus who was born. And we can't much speak of his, his, his coming to us without also speaking of his death. Because he has a weak beginning, but he has a very powerful death. Christ came to win the greatest war in the history of mankind. Colossians chapter 1 reads this. It says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Christ rules and establishes peace by giving up his life. And he does that to remove and defeat the root cause of the hostility, of the animosity, the enmity that stands between man and God. And Christ's rule offers true peace. Where they, they had tried to experience peace, but it, but it wasn't a lasting peace. It wasn't a, a, a peace that could endure. But Christ offers true peace because the problem that is causing the war and the conflict is removed and defeated. So there is the promise and, of, of peace that is made after peace is lost, the promise is made, and then there's this announcement that peace is here. So for all of us today, as we, as we just reflected on our world and everything, man, if peace is here, where is it? Why do we still experience the world that we live in? So where is this peace? If it's been announced that it's here, where is it? And so lastly, we need to look at the re realization of peace found. How does Jesus bring peace? How do we experience it? How do we know that it's there? What should we expect of this peace? And the first thing that's very clear in Scripture is that, first of all, Joey alluded to this when he started, is that, that we first of all have internal peace. Our relationship with God is restored. Romans 5.1 declares these beautiful words. It says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Christ's death and resurrection, we are brought back into a right relationship with God. That which was fractured in the fall can now be restored. We're no longer under His wrath, but we're brought into this peaceful relationship with God. In Colossians, he speaks of, of transferring us from the dominion, the reign of darkness, into the kingdom of God's Son. God doesn't just, just defeat us and, and reign over us by His force of oppressive rule. But he takes us and, and brings us into his house, into his kingdom, and rules and reigns as a peaceful king. 
So what does that mean in your own life? It means that, that if, if, if we're reconciled to God, if we have peace with God by being justified from our sins through the blood of Jesus, then we can rest. We can, we can, we can find that tranquility and that calmness that, that we long for in God. John 16, as, as Jesus was, was about to be put to death and leave, he gave these words to his disciples. He said, I'm telling you these things so that you will have peace. He says, in the world, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have tribulation. You're going to have trial. He warned them. He said, it's going to be hard life. But he says, take heart. Take, like, like the fact that I have overcome the world is what he says. That fact and that reality should give you peace, calmness, the ability to weather and walk through the difficulties and the trials of life. So it means that we can experience peace in the midst of this peace isn't the removal of all external conflict and difficulty, but this peace is offered in the midst of external conflict and difficulty. I don't know if anybody's ever been to a cabin, maybe, maybe a, a cabin that's uh, in the mountains, in the woods, and maybe it's been in the middle of winter and there's been an incredible blizzard outside. Or even in your, in your homes here in Fort Collins on a night where it's just coming down, where the snow is coming down. It is cold, windy. You look out the window and it just seems like a terrible place to be. Where the snow's just, just building up, piling up. People in Buffalo experienced this recently. But, but inside, inside that cabin, maybe you have a fire going. It's warm. It's calm. And you're good. You're good. It's, it's peaceful. You find peace amidst this storm of life, of, of this difficulty. And Jesus is, it's proclaimed that Jesus is our peace. He is the embodiment of peace for us. Because He has, He has restored the, our relationship with God. So no matter what you're going through, like, take heart in the fact that, that you stand approved and accepted before a holy God. And with that, we can therefore unload anxiety, fear, burden, struggle. We can unload those things on God, and through His Spirit, we can experience peace that is unheard of in this world. That's what Paul declares in Philippians chapter 4. He says, don't be anxious, don't worry about things. And he says, don't do that because you have an alternative. And your alternative is to, is to through prayer, and asking and supplication and with thanksgiving, let your requests and your anxiety be known, made known to God. And it says, and in that, through that, the peace of God, which passes understanding, which you will not be able to explain, will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There's this internal peace that, that we, as, as Christians who are in a right relationship with God, can experience in our lives. We can fight for it. We can, we can claim it. We can find it. But not only do we have internal peace, but we also experience relational peace with mankind. There's this incredible passage in Ephesians chapter 2 that I've been dwelling on this week. And it was just, it was just so impactful to me this week as I, as I thought about things going on in our world right now, in our country, and the conflict and strife that is taking place right now. In Ephesians 2 verses 11 through 19, Paul declares these incredible world-shaping words. And he says, remember, speaking to the Gentile believers, he says, remember you Gentiles, that you were at that time, before you came to Christ, you were separated from Christ, you were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and you were strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. This dire situation that they found themselves in. But now in Christ Jesus, you, who were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down the, in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances 
that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. And he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross and kill the hostility. He preached peace to you who were far off and peace to you who were near. And through him, we are declared to be fellow citizens and members of the household of God. So the death of Jesus not only restores us individually in our relationship with God, but it restores us and unites us with all other believers into the household of God. Paul's point in Ephesians 2 is that the blood of Jesus reconciles us to people, Jew and Gentile, that were separated. There was, there was something in between. There were specific things in between them that stood there, that separated them, that, that resulted in hostility, in conflict, in unacceptance. But the unity that we share through the gospel, through the blood of Jesus breaks down everything that formerly divided and separated people. Think through, th think about maybe in your backyard, how you have your property, your, your yard, maybe you have a big privacy fence. Big fence, you can barely even see through it, you can't see over it. it, it separates your yard from your neighbors. That's kind of the picture of, of these things that he's describing that separated Jew and Gentile. There was something there that separated these people. And it says that in Christ, that, that fence is torn down, it's destroyed, it's taken apart, so now these two yards, these two lives are now united. Everything that once excluded some people has been removed, and the offer of full unity, of full peace between people is made a reality. The possibility of that is made a reality in Jesus. You see, the blood of Jesus removes religious, cultural, social, and racial boundaries. So what are the implications for, the, for us, for in our lives today? How, 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 how much of this should we expect? Shouldn't everything be just awesome and perfect? Well, we have to realize that we are, we are never going to able to be able to fully bring in and establish the peace of God, the shalom that is promised in the Old Testament. That is going to come as Jesus returns and establishes that forever. So we live, as, as we talk oftentimes of this already and this not yet, we already experience these things, but, but they're, they're not in full. But one day, not yet there, one day we will see those things come to fruition and completion. So does that mean that uh, we just wait for that to happen and uh, we just, you know, it is what it is until Christ comes back and changes everything? Because of these truths that Paul declared, what we share in the gospel, the unity of the gospel that it creates between us as believers, means that insofar as we can, we should seek to evidence, reflect, advance, and declare to this world, to our friends, to our neighbors, that the peace that we already experience can be made known to them. So as his image bearers, we have to carry the message of reconciliation. That's, that's how we do it first. It's primarily through the proclamation of the gospel. The call to make disciples, as, we, as we've been hammering and hammering. So we, so we do this through the proclamation of the gospel and also by the evidence that we experience that peace in our own lives. It means that we who are at peace with God should be the first ones to seek peace and extend peace to others. And this starts first with our, with our perspective on all people. How do you view people, particularly people that are different than you? Do you see all people as image bearers of the Creator? We must see everyone as people who bear and have been made in the image of God, who need to be restored in their relationship with God in order that they might manifest His character and His nature. This means that Christians, those who are at peace with God, should be the most welcoming people. It means that we constantly seek to cast off our prejudices, 
identify and change our negative presuppositions about race, culture, ethnicity, social class. We have to seek to display in our words and our actions and our relationships that we value all men and women equally before God. We set aside our sinful attitudes towards people we don't understand, that we simply don't get along with, or who are just plain different than us. John Piper writes these powerful words in regards to this text in, in Ephesians chapter 2. He says this, If Christ died, mark this, died, to make the church a diverse, reconciled body of Jew and Gentile, red, yellow, black, and white, and every shade and shape in between, then to glory in the cross is to glory in the display of the fruit of that cross. And the fruit of the cross is no, no more clearly seen than in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, where it speaks of, of the lamb who was slain, and he says, you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. The blood of Jesus has united and called a diverse set of people to himself. So let's push this out just a little bit further in our own lives. Right now, in our, in our nation, there's, there's a lot of conflict and strife over some of these issues. And in light of the events that are causing conflict and difficulty in places like Ferguson, Missouri, and in New York, Regardless of your take on the situation and what actually happened in those specific things, you can debate all that, and I don't know if we'll ever know. But at the very least, as you view all people as those who are made in the image of God, are we as Christians, as the church, willing to listen and show compassion towards those who are crying out about what they experience and what they feel in terms of racial differences, and racial discrimination that, that exists in our world, our country, and even at times our churches? Do you desire for peace to be found through the destruction of those racial tensions? Because in Christ, His blood has destroyed and done away with those things that divide and separate. And do we, by our actions, our attitudes, and our perspective, seek to show that and evidence that in our lives, in the way that we interact with people, the way that we listen to people. To push this down a little bit further practically, do you welcome and accept people who are just different than you? We could list a thousand different differences, not just, not just race, ethnicity, social class. It could be maybe based on your, on, on hobbies. People who are just different, who like to do to you the things that are strange. People who just grew up in a different background than you, who you just don't connect with, you don't see eye to eye with, do you accept and welcome those people? People who dress differently, have a different style than you? Whatever it could be, we could, we could list a thousand different, different ways in which there's, there's small things and large things that separate, divide, exclude, and separate people and even Christians. Specifically in your life group. Is there somebody in your life group who like you look at and you just say, I don't understand them. I don't get them. And then do you, do you kind of politely seek to avoid them? A polite hello here and there? Or do you try to, because of the reconciling nature of the cross, do you seek to build a relationship with them and take joy and rejoice in your differences and celebrate those things? and appreciate those things about each other? What does that look like in your life group? Are you willing, as you look at a life group, trying to find a place to settle? Are you trying to find the place that's just perfect for you, that everybody's like you, that you can really connect with and just have a great social time with? Or do you see it as an opportunity to, to invest and care for and, and live life with people who are very different from you? Where there's generational gaps, ways in which we just see the world a little different, where it's hard to understand each other. That through the gospel and it's recognizing that we evidence that in our lives and our relationships with people. 
especially in the church. So it starts with our own personal perspective on all men created in the image of God. And then it moves on to where we are moved to action to pursue relational peace in every sphere. Because of the peace that we experience with God, how we are accepted and made into a right relationship with God, we should seek to extend that peace to others. Do you run from a relational conflict? Do you burn bridges with people? Are frustrated and bail and leave and try to go find new relationships? Do you run from that? Or do you pursue and are you the one to step out and seek restoration? Because God reached down and showed you unbelievable love and forgiveness when we were enemies of God. In your arguments with your spouse, with your roommate, with your friends, your coworkers, whoever's in your life, in your arguments and your conflict with those people, we all have it, let's admit it. In those things, are you willing to lay down your weapons? Are you willing to set aside your defenses and show love and forgiveness to others? Because God showed us love and forgiveness in Christ. Now, even as we do this, it's not gonna, it's not just gonna happen. It's not, we're not gonna be able to maintain and find and restore peace in all situations, in all circumstances, all relationships. It won't happen. But what is our desire? What is our, what are we driven to? As we understand what we have been given, what God has done for us. But especially in your relationships with other believers. When conflicts arise, do you view the source of those conflicts, the source of those hurts and those pains, do you view those things as something that has been covered and paid for and removed by the blood of Jesus? Do you view the sins against you that cause you, that cause you frustration and anger? Do you view those things as covered sin? And are you willing to be wronged and forgive and extend peace because Jesus was wronged for us and extended peace to us. Maybe during this Christmas season, for, for many it's a time of, of joy, of hope, but for, for many it can be a, a time of, of difficulty, of uh, dread. Maybe getting together with family is really hard. Maybe there's conflicts, maybe there's tensions that are there. It can be a hard season. For many. But will we be the ones who seek to extend and display peace in those circumstances? May not be able to attain it, may not be able to be found fully, but, but by understanding what we've been given and the peace that's been shown to us, are we willing to extend that and seek that peace with others? We can only truly be reconciled to each other to a right relationship to each other if we have first been brought into a right relationship with God. So there's, there's internal peace that we experience. There's relational peace. And then lastly, what we long for, what we hope to see someday and is coming is an eternal cosmic peace in all of creation. And we don't have time to really dive into this, but Isaiah 9 and Romans 8 declares of a day when... Even this creation, everything will be made new, will be restored when Christ returns. And his government will come finally and be established in full reality to create and restore peace. And he will rule. He will be the eternal king, the one to sit on David's throne forever. And he does that to maintain peace. And he will restore and renew our own hearts, our bodies. This physical world will be made new to manifest peace. And he is about the reversal of this curse, of, of this loss of peace. He's about restoring that and bringing it back. And even though we take hope in that, that long-awaited time when we see him return, as we celebrate his first coming, we look forward and we long for his second coming, where we can experience thing, these things in full. But insofar as we experience them initially, 
as they are made a reality to us? How do we show and evidence those things in our lives? So first of all, do you experience the peace that Jesus offers? Have you submitted your life to his lordship? And do you experience the freedom from knowing that you and the creator of the universe are not at odds, but you are at peace, that you're accepted and you're loved? And then secondly, do you seek and pursue peace in your relationships? Your relationships with people because of the peace that you have experienced with God? Do you seek to bear the image of God and live at peace as much as is possible with all people? In Matthew 5, it declares that, that blessed are the peacemakers because they will be called the sons of God. Those who reflect God. Insofar as we make peace, we're reflecting God to this world. And it happens in our perspective on people, in our pursuit of reconciliation and restoration with people, in our relationships, our marriages, our friendships, our labors. And this is the hope of the gospel. This is the joy that's found in the gospel. And this is what we're called to, not just during this season, but every day of our lives. So let's bow and pray and ask God that his peace would, would take root in our hearts and our lives and would draw us to be a people who evidence and show peace in all aspects.